if you're here this morning and you're your guest, we welcome you. Um, we're really glad that you're here with us. We only ask that you do one big thing for us. Um, there are some connection cards in the back of the queue in front of you. We'll tell you in advance what we do with those. Um, that's just a way for us to have um, some contact information so we can send you some information to mail about our church and give you a phone call or email to see if there's any questions that we can answer or any way that we can serve you or your family during this time. But we're delighted that you're here to worship with us and we pray that you will feel welcome. Also, if you have children worshiping with you today, they're more than welcome to stay in the service um, for the entirety. Also, when you provide the little seat kids about halfway through the service is dismissed, um, that's ages three through eight years old. Um, they can go down to the fellowship hall and uh, for some age-appropriate Bible study during the sermon time. So you're welcome to take advantage of that. Um, you'll see the children dismissed about midway through. Just pick them up wherever you drop them off. We'd appreciate that. Um, if you would, be in prayer for our student ministry. So um, about, I think, 20-plus folks, maybe 21 people. That's including a few adults. Um, uh, we dropped them off Friday uh, about 6 p.m. down in Oregon at a uh, winter retreat camp. And so they're there with some sister churches um, worshiping, um, studying God's Word, having a blast. My understanding is no one's been lost in the snow yet. Um, so they, they're having a great time. Um, our, our students this morning right now are with Christ Church in Sterling, the church plant that we've been supporting and praying for and with, and um, they're able to provide, um, they're going to lead the music there this morning, they are um, leading the children's ministry, they're trying to give, this is the first break that their volunteers of that church have had since they've launched. And so just be in prayer for the Christ Church, that they would be uplifted by our students and our volunteers there, and, um, and of course pray for um, our students, that it would have a wonderful effect on them. Um, those moments of camp have a tremendous impact on the lives of young people, so let's be sure to, to pray for them as they finish up today. They'll travel back home tomorrow. Um, we don't have any announcements this morning, so what I'd like to do is if you'll turn your attention to the screen or to your bulletin for the call to worship from Psalm 99, I will read the portion that says Elder, and you can respond with the portion that says All. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. We have come this morning to worship this God who is thrice holy. And so stand with us and sing holy, holy, holy.
be seated for our confession of faith. As we often contemplate our sin, I think it's more important to contemplate the fact that there is now no condemnation for those who confess their sin. And the weight of that just struck me this morning as I was going through the service of what God offers us to our souls. And so this morning, let's confess privately those sins, and then in a moment we'll confess together. Would you bow and confess privately? Amen. Now, would you join me on the screen um, behind me as we confess together? Eternal God, we confess that we have fa failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Paul says in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Would you stand again as we sing? Christ promised us, if you abide in my words, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The good news, the truth, is that the proof of God's love for us is here in this gospel song. So let's sing together um, to praise our Lord, who forgives us and saves us from death. cheaply. As old saying goes, freedom is never free, and our freedom came with an insurmountable price, which Christ paid in our stead on the cross. So let's continue to sing and praise him.
sing. You may now be seated as we continue our worship with scripture reading and offering. Would you pray with me? Father, we think of all that you've given to us, your gift of grace, the ability to rejoice in sufferings, hope, and peace. Father, forgive us of our sins as that those often get in way of us experiencing those joy. But nevertheless, you are always present and Christ is with us to be our wisdom, to be our peace, to be our hope, to allow us to rejoice. And so, Father, we thank you for Jesus. And now, Father, we pray you bless our offerings bless our time of scripture reading together. And I pray this through Jesus. Amen. We're going to read in, from Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and from verse 15 through 17 and 21 and 22 in Russian. <coughs> Когда же народ был в ожидании и все помышляли в сердцах своих об Иоанне, не Христос ли он? Иоанн всем отвечал, я крещу вас водою, но идет сильнейший меня, у которого я не достоин развязать ремень обуви, он будет крестить вас Духом Святым и огнем. Лопата его в руке его, и он очистит гумно свое и соберет пшеницу в житницу свою, а солому сожжет огнем неугасимым. Когда же крестился весь народ, и Иисус, крестившись, молился, отверзлось небо, и Иисус, и Дух Святой не шел на него в телесном виде, как голубь, и был глаз небес глаголющий. Ты, Сын мой возлюбленный, в тебе мое благоволение. This is the word of the Lord. I'll be reading from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory, the God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul writes about Christian freedom. I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Let's stand together and sing this in our mind as we reach upward towards the goal of call of Christ uh, call of Christ Jesus <laughs>
followers, becoming Christians. God makes us a new creation, and more importantly, a part of something bigger and greater than ourselves. So in this here and now, there's something glorious in the collective praise of our awesome God. So let's continue singing together, praising our God for who he is. <laughs> dismissed for Children's Church. You may now be seated as we continue our worship through today's sermon. Well, as we continue our worship this morning, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Before I do that, I just want to mention 
a quick praise and uh, prayer request. So um, the members that we're praying for this morning are Brian and uh, Margaret Clark, and many of you know them, but I was talking with uh, Brian this morning, and he alluded to the fact that this week he turns 82. And so um, as we pray for them, let's just rejoice in the many years that the Lord has given Brother Brian and pray for many, many more. And um, let's thank the Lord for the blessing that he and Miss Margaret are to us as a church family. Let's pray. Our Father, in the stillness and quietness of this moment, we come before you lifting our hearts in prayer. Lord, we've come into this building today not to declare our worthiness or our righteousness or our good deeds, but Father, we have come into this place because we are empty. We are broken. Most of us, Lord, have come in here very aware of our own sinfulness, our need for your righteousness, our need for mercy and forgiveness. And the wonderful thing, Lord, is you have provided all of that in Jesus Christ. And so we come this morning to look to him. We pray that you would help us see him. We pray that your spirit would help us to see Jesus in his humiliation on the cross and also in his exaltation, sitting at your right hand, resurrected and reigning powerfully. Father, would you help us to grasp by your spirit this morning the height and the depth and the breadth of your love for us in Jesus Christ. Would you increase our ability, Lord, to worship you? Would you increase our ability to love you? Would you enlarge our small and hard hearts? And would you pour out your love to us through your spirit? Father, we need you to do this. We cannot do this in and of ourselves. A self-help talk this morning will not last very long. So, Father, we ask that you would meet us in this hour. And that you would transform us by your word. We pray this, Father, not only for ourselves, but we think about first um, Ephri and Pastor Luke this morning. As many are gathering there and the truth of the gospel is being sung and prayed and preached, I ask that you'd bless them, that you would prosper their efforts to make much of Jesus this morning. I think also, Lord, for Christ Church in Sterling, Pastor Aaron, as he's going to be bringing the word to that new church in the town of Sterling, I pray, God, that you'd bless them. I pray that our students there would be fed by you as they serve. May they experience your joy and your pleasure as they labor in children's ministry and in music ministry. Help our people to just be your hands and your feet to Christ church. And I ask that that congregation too would prosper this morning. I think about our members this morning who we're so grateful for, Brian and Margaret Clark. And thank you for their steadfastness and just their testimony of faith through many years of following you and serving you. I thank you for the 82 years that you've given Brother Brian, and I pray that as he celebrates his birthday this week, we could rejoice with him in the enormous goodness of God uh, in giving so many years of life and health and strength to our brother. And most of all, Father, thank you for saving Brian and Margaret. Thank you for the joy that they both have and the encouragement that they are to us. We pray your blessings on them this week. We think about Michael and Liz whole serving in France. We pray for a great awakening spiritually in France, Lord. We pray that you would strengthen Michael and Liz as they try to be faithful to share your gospel and to teach your word and to instruct the churches there. God, strengthen their resolve, I pray. Open your word to them that they too would be fed continually, daily, so that they might persevere. We pray for those in government, Lord, that you would grant tremendous mercy to the U.S. government. We think specifically about Tammy Duckworth in the U.S. Senate. 
representing the state of Illinois, we pray, Father, that you would give wisdom, that you would give um, a heart of fairness and justice and righteousness. I pray that um, Mrs. Duckworth would make decisions, Father, in such a way that would cause our state to prosper and she would remember the poor in her decisions, Father. There's so many in our fellowship who have needs this morning. I think specifically, Lord, about um, Nancy Hunt and Jeff and Jackie Madsen, Ray Fry's mother, Ina Pegram, Terry Miller, Karen Matra, Peggy Dowell. These are all people, Lord, that we know and that we love. We want to lift them and to your throne this morning and pray that you would work on their behalf in a way that only you can, Father. They need you. They need your presence and your strength and your healing power, Father. And so we ask that you would meet them this very hour. God, as we turn our attention now to your word, we pray that you would help us. Um, I do not feel sufficient for the task, and so I pray that your spirit would take your word and make much of Jesus. We pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. If you would turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. We are launching a new series this morning through this short book, and so we'll spend a couple of months, or right at a couple of months, in the letter of Colossians. And so if you want to turn to chapter 1, this is one of the um, interesting things about being committed to expository preaching, and that's that I had the pleasure this week, and you have the pleasure this morning, of hearing a salutation preached. Um, I'm often uh, not sure what the Apostle Paul would think about us preaching his salutation. I think it would be humorous for him to listen, Um, but nonetheless, we believe that God has inspired every word in Paul's letters, and we therefore want to give time and attention to each of these verses in the book of Colossians. And so we're going to begin in, uh, in verse 1, chapter 1. And so as you're making your way there, I want to talk to you for just a moment about something that is currently plaguing our society. Um, if the statistics are right, then there are multiple people under the sound of my voice this morning who are dealing with the very things that I'm about to talk about in this introduction. Um, anxiety and depression... Um, have reached heights statistically that are almost um, unrecordable. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America has tried to compile some figures of what our society is currently facing in regards to um, this epic of increased anxiety um, disorders. And so this morning, I know that there are different ways people think about um, mental illness and emotional difficulties. And so I'm not arguing for one way or the other. I just want to introduce these statistics to you, and then I want to turn your attention to how Paul addresses this in his letter, in the beginning of his letter to the Colossians. But the Anxiety and Depression Association of America put out some statistics. And listen to a couple of these. I think they will be insightful, maybe even alarming. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting an estimated 40 million adults. That's the age of 18 and older. 18.1% of the population, the adult population in the United States, are estimated to have a diagnosable struggle with anxiety. People with anxiety disorder are three to five times more likely to go to the doctor, six times more likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders than those who do not suffer from anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders develop from a complex set of risk factors all the way from genetics and the possibility of brain chemistry and personality, even life and dramatic events. Um, Really, it's endless what can cause the emotion of anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression in, by the Association of America, they reported on these things together because they said they're so um, intricately twined. It is very rare that someone deals with anxiety that does not struggle with depression. It's very rare that someone would deal with depression and not struggle with anxiety. 
and so they are reporting these disorders together. I'm just going to read a couple of the numbers to you. So the amount of folks, adults in the U.S. who have a generalized anxiety disorder, which is just the most general kind that you could have, is estimated at 6.8 million adults. Six million adults will be affected by something called panic disorder. 15 million adults, social anxiety disorder. 2.2 million adults, obsessive compulsive disorder. 7.7 million adults, post-traumatic stress disorder. The numbers and the diagnoses go on and on and on. Children are even affected by this. 25.1% of children between the ages of 13 and 18 are estimated to have an anxiety disorder of some kind. Depression, they report, is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Almost 75% of people with mental disorders remain untreated. And finally, and really the most sad and telling piece of all of these numbers and statistics is this, that in developing countries, almost one million people a year take their lives because of severe depression that leads to suicide. Now, why do I read those? I'm not trying to make a point about mental illness or bring up a theological debate about how to define mental illness. I mainly want to present to you the reality of those statistics. Um, in a group this size, I know that there are people in this room who are plagued with difficulty in regards to anxiety and stress and depression. God's people are not exempt from these negative emotions. In his autobiography, Alias Jungle Doctor, that came out in 1977, a missionary Dr. Paul White concludes in his chapter, Doctor at Work, on his medical career. He says this, I found that friendship, fellowship, and encouragement lifted a person's morale. This is his experience of being a missionary doctor in the jungle. He says this, encouragement, be it physical or spiritual, is the most powerful and useful tonic in the pharmacy. This is a, a missionary doctor in the 70s saying that encouragement, fellowship, friendship, were the greatest medicine that he had found for emotional difficulty. And we would call these things today, obviously, anxiety and depression. The reason I presented those statistics to you and the reason I quote this missionary doctor is because the Apostle Paul, in the, his opening statements to the church of Coloss Colossae, is going to address the fact of encouragement. He, this is his goal. If I had to say to you, well, what is, what is the Apostle Paul's goal in this early part of the first chapter of his letter to the Colossians. His goal is to encourage them, to bring a certain measure of assurance to their souls. They are facing a number of enemies, some of their own making, I'm sure, but many from within the church, many false gospels and false doctrines rising up, the difficulties that come in following Jesus, suffering, trials, even emotional trauma are coming against the church at Colossae. Look with me if you would in verse 1. We'll begin reading in Paul's letter to the Colossians. He, he writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood it understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our, fellow, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. 
May God bless the reading of his word this morning. I want to begin this morning by simply pointing out to you the occasion of this letter. So I will not do this again in the sermon series, and so I wanted to take this morning, a good chunk of this morning, and present to you the occasion of which Paul writes this letter. I think you're going to see the occasion in verses 1 and 2 and 7 and 8. So the occasion of Paul's letter to the Colossians. It becomes very obvious in verse, uh, verses 1 and 2, and I'm not pretending as though you can't read or simply understand this, but I just want to point it out and bring it to your attention, that in the first few verses it's very clear who's writing this letter and to whom the letter is being sent. He says very clearly, Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. We know Paul and Timothy in the New Testament. We understand this to be the Apostle Paul, the great missionary, church planter, and his, his partner, his son in the ministry, Timothy. And so both of them are together. They're um, presented as the ones that are um, writing this letter. This is obviously Paul's letter, but he's saying that Timothy is there and greeting them as well. And the letter is to, we see in verse 2, to the saints. The saints. You, you could translate that, by the way, holy ones. Um, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. So very clearly and very simply, this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to believers, those who have believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the city of Colossae. And he simply says to them, grace to you and peace from God our Father. It's important that you understand two things. One, that the Apostle Paul is writing this around 60 AD, and this is when he is imprisoned in Rome. This is his first imprisonment. He's, so he has two times that he's in a Roman prison, and the first, if you remember, is when people could visit him. They could come and go. Do you remember that? Um, that's very evident in his missionary journeys, that he, he, won, he appeals to Caesar, and so they put him in Rome. And if you remember, the, all of the um, leaders said he was innocent. They could have let him go had he not asked to go to Caesar, but he knew it was God's will that he go testify in front of Caesar. And so in waiting to see Caesar, Paul is in prison, but he's under house arrest. And so they let his friends come and go, and, and honestly, he begins a wonderful teaching and writing ministry in Rome, um, waiting to see Caesar. It's in that scenario that Paul pens this letter to the Colossians. And so there Paul is in his under house arrest, under Roman imprisonment, writing this letter to the Colossians. Now Colossae is a, is a town that's located in the southwest corner of what would be, what would be modern day Turkey. And so that's where you can picture this occurring. This is a, a town that's 11 miles from a major city. And so during this time, a major city would have been Laodicea, which um, also is, has a church established in it. And you hear about Laodicea in the book of Revelation even. And so Laodicea is kind of the, the larger town, 11 miles from Colossae. Also not far um, from Colossae or a couple other cities we'll mention in a minute, but there's basically a church planting movement that happens in this area. It's an area known, and you'll realize this from the Bible, called Asia Minor. This is the Lycus Valley um, where Paul is writing to these Christians. Now, why is this important? It's important that you realize the context in which Paul gives this letter. The, this is a city. Colossae is a city much like our own, Rockford. And let me tell you why. So Colossae was a place where a trade highway once went right through the center of the town. It was a booming town for business and economy. Um, some of the most powerful people in the world at this time traveled um, when I say at this time, so prior to um, Paul's letter, that is, in the time of its height, um, powerful people visited Colossae. Um, there's records of Xerxes making a visit to the town of Colossae. There is a record of Cyrus the Great visiting the city of Colossae. However, during Paul's time, um, Colossae had dwindled down to barely anything. The highway had moved 11 miles north and now ran through Laodicea. And so much like cities all over the Rust Belt, the business went with the highway. The business and the economy and professionals and, and education and money 
everything left the city of Colossae and moved north to Laodicea, following the trade route. Why is that important? It's important that you understand that it is, it is in this small, forsaken little town that once was glorious and now is full of rust and broken buildings and broken windows. If they had windows, they probably didn't back then, but I'm just giving you an image. This run-down, small town, it's that little town that the Apostle Paul pens the letter with the highest Christology of all the Bible. This is important. That God does not look down on small people in small places. The Bible does this over and over and over again. And I don't want you to miss it this morning. That this letter to the Colossians, which has the highest doctrine of Jesus Christ mentioned in the New Testament. And we're about to get there in just a couple weeks. Is really a forgotten place by the world. One scholar said this about Colossae. Colossae was, um, was the least important place to which a document that was later canonized was ever sent. That's what one Bible scholar said. I mean, this, this place should not have gotten a Bible letter, is what the, the scholar is saying. It makes no sense that Colossae, the church at Colossae, would have received this glorious doctrine of Jesus Christ. But they did. Though the economically wealthy and powerful had forgotten this little town, God had not forgotten them. This town was full of, of, um, of, of Greeks and it was full of, of Jews. It was a mixed culture. There were all kinds of people in this town buying up the cheap residential properties where business once was prosperous and now it's long gone. We learn from this letter that God cares about forgotten people in forgotten places. The other thing I want you to see in setting the occasion of the letter is actually in verses 7 and 8. I want you to know um, where the church came from. How, how did the gospel get to the city of Colossae? Look at verse 7. Paul, Paul begins to, to help us understand that. In verse 7, he says, Just as you learned it, so where did they learn about Jesus. He said, you learned it from Epaphras, our, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras at some point had heard the gospel outside of Colossae and now brings the gospel to Colossae and then goes back to Paul and is making reports. Paul saying, I'm writing to you because I've heard of your love, of your faith, of your hope. Turn with me to the end of the book real quick. Chapter 4, verse 12. At the end of the book, Paul gives us a glimpse again into where, um, where the church at Colossae came from. How did it get there? Verse 12 of chapter 4. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. So who's the church planter in this area? Paul? Timothy? No, it's this man Epaphras that we hardly know much of. It's believed, by the way, that Epaphras um, came to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he heard his gospel in the city of Ephesus, that Epaphras is most likely a businessman. And so he's leaving Colossae, where he's from and, and where he probably was born and raised, and traveling into larger cities trying to make money. This is not rare for small town people, is it? Um, this is what folks often do. They drive into the cities for work. But if you remember in the city of Ephesus in Acts, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 19, um, specifically verses 8 through 10, that's where the Apostle Paul for two years begins to lecture in the hall of Tyrannius. Do you remember that? Have you ever heard of that? In the city of Ephesus. Listen to what is recorded in Acts 19. It says that Paul was teaching in this hall for two years, and it was heard by all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks. What an unbelievable statement that Paul's in Ephesus, and the biblical record says that everybody heard what he was teaching, Jews and Greeks. It's in that context the residents of Asia hearing the gospel. And they say Jews and Greeks, all of them hearing it, as Paul's lecturing in the city of Ephesus. 
It's in that, God, that um, context that we believe it's most likely that's when Epaphras was converted. There he sits in the hall. The lunch hour um, Bible sessions, the late night teachings of Paul where people are falling out of windows. That's the context in which Epaphras is hearing these words of Jesus Christ and is being transformed in his heart. And then Epaphras does what any person who is transformed would do. He goes back home and shares what's happened. It becomes evident that he is the church planter in Asia Minor. It is Epaphras that plants the church at Colossae. It's most likely Epaphras that planted the church at Laodicea. It's most likely Epaphras that planted the church at Hierapolis. All of these little cities, by the way, are 10 miles from each other. What a neat thing to be able to see this church planter Epaphras goes and takes the word of God from the big city of Ephesus to the small town of Colossae. And God does a great work and there's a church. In regards to the occasion of the letter, there's a couple things you need to know. Paul's going to address, he's going to say wonderful things about Jesus. He's going to talk about um, things that are very hard to understand about the doctrine of Jesus. And then he's going to talk about how that affects our, our home life and our work life our thought life. But the question is, why does he address these things the way that he does? I want you to see that there are some some problems, some difficulties going on in Colossae. Now, Colossae appears to be a fairly healthy church by most measures, but even a good church has difficulty within it, doesn't it? I want to show you some things that are going on uh, among the people, the Christians in Colossae, that, that, that grant Paul the reason for saying what he says. Turn with me to chapter 2 for a minute. I want to show you that there's Judaism creeping up and drowning out the gospel in the church at Colossae. Look what the Apostle Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 16. He says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So already in chapter 2, you see that the Apostle Paul is teaching about how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish law. So there's obviously some people in Colossae struggling with that principle. There's obviously some people in Colossae that are teaching um, that there's a lot of value in what you drink and what you eat and festivals you keep and Sabbaths that you keep. And Paul rebukes that thinking. There's some form of Judaism creeping into the church. Paul's going to address that by pointing them to Jesus. There's also asceticism creeping into the church. Look at verse 18 in the same chapter. Let no one disqualify you, he says, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. So Paul's saying that there are people who are puffed up and proud and they're teaching asceticism. That if you punish yourself enough, God will love you. That if you discipline your body enough, you will become holier. And so they're teaching this apart from the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to bring corrective. He says that the person teaching this is not holding fast to the head, capital H, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. There's some also some form, not only Judaism and asceticism in the, in the church at Colossae, but there's also some form of early Gnosticism. Now, I know that sounds like an impressive word. It's actually not that impressive. The word, the word gnosis is just that is knowledge. And so there were people teaching, in, in the um, teaching of early Gnosticism, this was a, a teaching where people believed that material things were bad, And so we wanted to turn away from the physical, the material, and seek God in the spiritual. And so they were always seeking the higher life, the spiritual life. And they were were separating themselves in some sense from material things. In doing so, that meant that they could sin as long as it was just their body, right? And as long as their spirits were pursuing God. They also believed that if they could get to a, a higher knowledge, they would be more like Jesus, You see this, by the way, look at chapter 1, verse 9. You see some of it spoken of here. He says in verse 9, And so from the day we heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you you may be filled with all the knowledge of his will 
in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul's already in chapter 1 of Colossians addressing this fact that they're seeking a fullness of knowledge, but he's going to tell them they're seeking it in the wrong place, that the fullness of knowledge comes in the face of Christ. We'll see that in a couple weeks. There's also some form of pagan philosophy going on in the church at Corinth. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 8. Some kind of pagan philosophy. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. So there is some type of philosophy, some type of worldly thinking that the Colossians are being affected by, and Paul wants to point out that is not of Christ. And so you need to bring your thinking under the philosophy of Jesus. So, so what in the world is going on in this little church that appears to be fairly healthy? The church at Colossae is not dying. The church at Colossae appears to be, he, he, we will see in this letter, he encourages them in many ways that they're doing right things and that they are prospering in the Lord. But what Paul is warning the church at Colossae about is what we have to be warned about today as well. And that is something called syncretism. Syncretism. So if you take Judaism, asceticism, Gnosticism, that's a lot of isms, isn't it? And, and pagan philosophy, well, what you find, if you mix all that together with Christianity, you have syncretism. Syncretism just means assimilating different doctrines between philosophical and religious ideas. So taking this philosophy and that doctrine, and this is what I like about Buddhism, I'm going to mix that in here with my Christianity, and this is what I like about um, Islam, and I'm going to mix that in here with Jesus. Surely he won't mind And just taking what I want and creating a religion that fits me, right? Syncretism is nothing new. If that, none of that made sense to you, let me tell it to you another way. So if, that just, if all those isms are gone, they're already out your other ear, listen to this. Jesus plus anything equaling salvation is syncretism. Jesus plus anything. So Jesus plus obedience. Jesus plus good works. Jesus plus praying a lot. Jesus plus keeping the right feasts. Jesus plus anything equals salvation. That's a false gospel. That's syncretism. That's what was going on in the church at Colossae. There were people that weren't saying they should deny Jesus. There were people saying they should add things to the gospel of Jesus. That's nothing new to us, is it? By the way, this first point is the longest point, so hang in there. It's an introduction. Paul is writing the saints in Colossae to call them to faithful Christianity by calling them to a robust Christology a robust study of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? And is anyone else equal? And do we need anything else in order to be saved by Jesus? That's the occasion in which Paul writes this letter to the church. Listen, this is exactly what we're facing today. This is exactly the same thing the church is facing today, is syncretism. Um, we're not being, we're, Christianity is not going to go away because of Islam, because Islam's attacking it. Christianity is not going to go away because of Buddhism or Hinduism. Christianity will weaken by small little false gospels that'll, that are mixed in to the Christian church. Small little things. Things like the prayer of Jabez and the prosperity gospel. Things like Catholicism, things like the Jesus calling, even good things like Financial Peace University, any, any gospel, anything we add that say Jesus plus using your money right, that will bring you favor with God. Now, don't misunderstand me. If you use Financial Peace University, you're not a false believer, or if you've taught the class, you're not. My point is overemphasizing things that are taught in Scripture and making them a requirement for salvation is syncretism. It's the same thing that the devil has been trying to destroy the church with from the beginning. And Paul's warning the church at Colossae about this attempt. 
The second thing I want you to see this morning is the, the triad of assurance. Here's where we're about to get into Paul's encouragement. So that was all the, the, the tough content you needed to understand as we launch into a study of the book of Colossians. All of that, by the way, for the most part, um, should answer verses 1 and 2. Who wrote this book and to whom did he write it? So the Apostle Paul writing to the people of Colossae. Well, in verses 3 through uh, 5a, we're going to see the triad of assurance. Let's look at those verses again together. Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So Paul is saying to the Colossians, We're praying for you, and we always have reason to be thankful. Why, Paul, are you thankful? What is the reason, what's the source of your thankfulness? Look at verse 4. He says, Since we heard of your faith, in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So look at this triad of assurance. Paul wants to Paul wants to encourage the Colossians that the gospel that they have believed is the right gospel, that it's the true gospel, that it is the only gospel. And so you can imagine in a place, in in a little church like Colossae, in this little town, that's been forgotten, and they have all these other ideas creeping in, Judaism and asceticism and Gnosticism and all kinds of little, you know, they're in a Bible study and someone says, I want to tell you what this verse means to me. And they say, what it means to me is, and they're teaching asceticism or Judaism or Gnosticism. You can imagine that all of a sudden as a young believer, you begin to think what's right and what's wrong. What is the the gospel that I should be believing? And this is the context in which Paul wants to say, I can thank God for you, Colossians, because of your faith, your love, and your hope. The triad of Christian assurance. The grounds for Paul's thankfulness is faith, hope, and love. This This is what some call the triad of Christian spirituality. How do I know if I'm a Christian? Are these things present? These three things, faith, hope, and love. Paul wants the Colossian believers um, to know that he holds their Christian experience, what he knows Epaphras taught them, and what they experience to be true, genuine Christianity. So this is, these are affirming statements that Paul would say, I'm praying for you, and I'm thankful for your faith in Christ, your love for the saints, and the hope that you have for what God has laid up for you. So you can imagine being a Colossian Christian confused and struggling to understand the gospel, hearing this from the Apostle Paul. What an encouragement. He believes our faith is true. He's saying that the love that we have for the saints is evidence of something. I, I thought it was, but then the, 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 uh, those who believe in asceticism said maybe not. And he's saying that the hope that we have for what is ours in heaven is a true hope. Notice, by the way, that the faith, hope, and love that these have objects that they are grounded in. Look, look, faith in Christ Jesus. Love for all the saints. Hope laid up for you in heaven. Paul wants the Colossian saints to know that the work of God in their lives is not subjective, super spiritual, and highly secretive. Isn't that how every false teaching happens? Every false teaching tells you that I want to teach you something really special about God that nobody else knows. It's secretive. It, it's special, and it's always higher and more important than the simple things that you have been taught. But Paul is assaulting that idea that some type of secret knowledge, some type of subjective um, intellect would help someone be closer to God. Paul is affirming that their faith is grounded in Jesus grounded in people loving the brethren and it's grounded in a hope of what they have in heaven let me just quickly try to define faith hope and love and then we'll move on paul paul uses this word faith that means assurance he says that that he is thankful that the colossian christians have an assurance in jesus christ a belief and paul would say to the hebrews in 11 Chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So the Colossian Christians have a conviction that their faith is in Jesus. I am assured in who Jesus is 
and what he has done for me. Right after um, Hebrews 11.1, 1, later in verse 6, Paul would say this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is where it all begins, isn't it? And Paul is acknowledging that that simple, childlike assurance that the Colossians put in the Lord Jesus Christ was enough for them. That's his point. There's not some other special secretive knowledge. It's just faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. But secondly, he pointed out their love. Their love. That's the Greek word agape. All kind of debate about what it means or what have you. It really just means love. It means beloved they genuinely loved the saints. Well, listen, this, this is quite impressive to me. He, he says that they, he didn't say you love the saints that are easy to love. He didn't say you love some of the saints. He didn't say you're doing really well with your small group or your Sunday school class. He said their love for all the saints. Jesus had transformed them in such a way that the Colossian Christians were known for their love for one another and, not, and no one being left out. This is not a foreign idea to the New Testament. In, the, in John's epistles, he will say, um, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Let me say something. Do you, if you want to know if you're a Christian or not, this is one of the most helpful things to say because many people say, I have faith in the Lord Jesus, but I can't stand the church. And that's like saying to me, Scott, I really like you, but I can't stand your wife. We're not going to be very close. So it's not going to work, right, our friendship. When you say, I really like you, but I can't stand your wife. That's what people are saying when they say, I have faith in Jesus, but I can't stand the church. Jesus died for the church. He bought the church with his precious blood. He says that she is his bride, right? And so if you have no love for the brethren, no love for the gathered saints, all you have for them is criticism and hypocrisy, calls out of hypocrisy, you have no identity with the people sitting in front of you, behind you, on your side. No affection for them at all. This is what should concern us. is to say, I have faith, but if I don't have love, something's wrong. Something's missing. The, Paul is affirming the faith of the Colossian Christians by saying, you have faith in Christ, but you have a love for all the saints that is evident. And then finally, he says, they have a hope. A hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Hope is, is literally the word expectation. It has the idea of anticipation in it. That, that people who have faith in Jesus Christ and love for those who have faith, others who have faith in Jesus Christ, that together they are hoping, they are expectant that God has done something for them and that it is stored up in heaven for them. We talked about this last week, so I don't want to spend much time on it. I just want to remind you of it. Romans chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. And he says, not only the creation, talking about the groaning of creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. What are we waiting on? Why are we groaning? We're waiting on our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, Paul says to the Romans. So we're waiting on this, the fullness of the redemption of our bodies. And he says in verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's Romans chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. Hope is not the consequence of faith and love. You don't have faith and love and so then comes hope. This is Paul's argument. Is this, this is why he doesn't say, um, um, he, doesn't, he puts them in proper order in this passage to the Colossians. Hope is not the consequence of faith and love, but the very opposite. Hope is the basis of faith and love. You see, that expectation of what God has done for us that is, that is stored up for us in heaven, the salvation that he has promised us that will one day be ours, the fullness of all that has promised us in glory, that is what we are believing, Right? That hope, Christ sitting at God's right hand with our inheritance. Our hope in that, what is ours in heaven, is where our faith and our love flow from. See, we go quite, we, normally we get that in the reverse, and we wonder why we don't have hope. God has completed, God has completed hope, what we hope in, on our behalf. This is an important point I want, you to, I want you to see. 
Our hope, what we hope in in heaven, the Bible teaches, is guaranteed. So hope, our expectation and what God is going to do for us, when our bodies are made right, when we're given a resurrection body, when all sin and hurt and pain are gone out of our life, when we have stood before God in the judgment and we are forgiven, we've been cleansed, Christ has fully saved us and we enter into God's kingdom, when all that all that you're thinking about in regards to that is guaranteed. Though it has not happened yet, God says it's guaranteed because it is finished on the cross of Christ. This is why Jesus cried out, it is finished. The work of redemption is done. The inheritance secured for Christ's people. Why, why, why am I saying this? It's, I need you to understand that your hope is secure. Think about this. Think about it this way. Who can charge the gates of heaven and take away what God is holding for you in Christ? Who can do that? Who can kick open the gates of heaven and take the inheritance that has been promised to us in Christ? Who can challenge the Almighty and say, but God, not that one? Who can loose the hands of God from holding on to what is yours in Christ? The answer is, of course, no one. No one can kick open the gates of heaven and charge the Almighty and demand what God has secured for us in the cross of Christ. No one can. And so in that sense, you need to understand it's done. It is done. There's nothing you'll do in this earth. No good deed left to be done. No prayer left to be prayed. That if you are in Christ, that inheritance is yours. And so what is the assurance of that inheritance? Faith and love. That this is how we can be assured. Our faith is evidence that that inheritance is coming. Our love is evidence that God is at work in us and the work will one day be completed in glory. This is why the Apostle Paul would say to the Thessalonian Christians, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the description of the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, the Colossians, their faith, their hope, and their love. We need to learn from the Apostle Paul in these opening verses of his letter to the Colossians, the power of encouragement. We need to realize that what Paul is doing with the Colossians, reminding them of the faith they have in Jesus Christ, the love that they have um, for the saints, that they didn't create that, that this is an evidence of God's divine work in them. It is an evidence of grace. Let me read to you a quote from one popular preacher in regards to the power, the motivation that one can receive in this way. He says, we will motivate others by grace when we perceive where and how he is at work in their lives and humbly let them know. So we will motivate others. We will motivate other Christians. You want to motivate your children to live for God? Want to motivate the people in your Bible study to live for God or your discipleship group? He says, we will motivate others by grace when we perceive where and how God is at work in their lives and humbly let them know. You don't realize how powerful that is. He, he goes on to argue, they need to know because so often they're unaware. Too many Christians are more readily aware of the absence of God than they are of the presence of God. And they are more aware of sin than they are of grace. God is at work. We motivate others by grace when we help them to see this and the one of the greatest joys we can experience is when we watch them come to that awareness. So do you want to be overjoyed? Help a Christian see and become aware of the evidences of God's work in their life. So when you see a brother or sister struggling in a trial and yet they're holding on, they're still believing, they're still trusting in the Lord, say to them, your faith is encouraging me. I see God strengthening you in faith because you didn't wake up today and say, forget God, I'm just going after the pain pills. No, you didn't say that. And so that's God's work in you. 
People need more encouragement. Christians need more encouragement. We are far more prone to say to one another, I bet you sinned and that's why God's doing that in your life. I bet, I bet the, the problem here is you're just in more sin. Now listen, that could be true. And if you see sin clearly, you need to lovingly um, share that with one another. But most often, we're all struggling to see God's work in us. We see the sin. We know the sin. We're trying to turn from the sin. We're fighting the sin. But what we need, to, what we need help seeing is God at work in us. Because we cannot see it. Gordon Fee said in regards to Paul's comments here, he says, Indeed, Paul's ability to give thanks for these Christians probably says much about his own character. In every redeemed person, there is evidence of the grace of God. And that brings forth Paul's gratitude, both to God and for them. To delight in God for his working in the, in the lives of others, even in the lives of those with whom one feels compelled to disagree, is sure evidence of one's own awareness of being the recipient of God's mercy. So what is Sophie is saying here that Paul, in his giving thanks for these Christians, is remembering God's grace in his own life, God's mercy in his own life. As Paul's calling out their faith and their love and their hope, he's remembering the faith, the love and the hope that God has gifted him. Do you see how this could work in the church? Do you see how we could become unbelievably powerful Christians if we could encourage one another consistently in this way? I'm not saying to the exclusion of fighting against sin. We're not putting this in opposition against turning from sin and fighting sin. We're adding this to that fight. I think as a church, we're very good at fighting sin. But I think we're very, very weak at giving evidences of grace in one another's lives. Brother, sister, I see God at work in you, and here's how. You don't realize the power that that can have. We're almost out of time, and so let me conclude by just pointing out Paul's final, the final point here in verses 5b through 8, and we might have to pick up on some of this next week, but the truth of the gospel. So where, where does that faith, the love, and the hope come from? Paul thanks God for it, but now he's going to tell us in the second half of verse 5 where it actually comes from. So look what he says in verse 5. He says, there's because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth. You've heard of faith in Christ, love for the saints, and hope that's laid up for you. And where did you hear it? You heard it in the word of truth, the gospel. He's reminding the Colossian Christians of when they first heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. And he says in verse 6, which has come to you, the gospel, it has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. You should circle this in your Bible. You should circle um, where Paul says uh, in verse, the second half of verse 5, of this you have heard. And then he says in, in verse 6 that it's bearing fruit, it's increasing as it does since the day that you heard it. And then you could circle understood the grace of God in Christ. And then look at verse 7, just as you learned, you could circle the word learned. Do you see the pattern here of how the gospel will affect our heart and our lives and our thinking? We must hear the gospel. We can't just hear it once. We must hear it every day. We must preach it to ourselves relentlessly, never stopping. There's not a day you can take off from needing to hear the gospel. We must hear it because it's in hearing it that we will be able to stand on it and believe it and obey it. He says that they have heard it, that they understood it, and that they learned it. All of those terms helping us understand we need to labor in the gospel. He calls it, um, he calls it the grace of God in truth, the word of the truth, the gospel. The Apostle Paul wants the Colossian Christians to know they need the gospel. Listen, they're not unbelievers. Do you realize that? This is not a letter to people who are not Christians. This is a letter to people who are believers. You need the gospel. 
You, you don't just need the gospel to get saved. You need the gospel to make it until the end. You will not make it until the last day when Jesus returns if you do not keep believing the gospel. It is the gospel that brings us into the kingdom. It is the gospel that will keep us in the kingdom. And it is the gospel that will deliver us into his kingdom. That's why it's good news. And Paul calls it the true gospel. He wants the Colossians to know there are other gospels around you. Jesus plus this equals salvation. But this is the true gospel, the work of Christ. It is not magical deeds that will fill you up or higher knowledge. He says it is the good news, the word of truth, the gospel. I love how he says that it's bearing fruit and increasing. If we had more time, we could delve into some of those terms. But in reality, what Paul is simply saying is that the gospel is powerful. That it was bearing fruit in all the world and that the Colossians could give testimony to this because it, he said, just as it is in you, that it was bearing fruit in them. You see, for one who has heard the gospel, understood the gospel, and learned the gospel, it bears fruit in you. It has transforming power. And Jerry Bridges would say this about Christians needing the gospel. Paul's encouragement to the Colossians to remember the gospel is instructive for us. And this is why Bridges points this out in his book, um, Disciplines of Grace. He says the typical evangelical paradigm is that the gospel is for unbelievers and the duty of discipleship are for believers. But the gospel is for believers also. And we must pursue holiness or any other aspect of discipleship in the atmosphere of the gospel. To do that, however, we must firmly grasp what the gospel is and what it means in practical terms and to preach it to ourselves every day. That's an end quote. That's by Jerry Bridges in his book, Disciplines of Grace. But Jerry is helping us there to understand that as Christians, we have a normal paradigm in our head that's wrong. You're going to wake up every day and think, I need, to, I need something more than the gospel. I need some deep things here. I'm fighting some hard sin. I need to transform at new levels. And so I need something new. And their argument is, no, there's nothing new. The power is in the gospel. The Apostle Paul would say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Well, take a few moments at your seat to quietly respond to God's word and to pray. And I will close us in corporate prayer in just a moment. Our Father, we come before you in prayer together this morning. And we need your help, Lord. These are not easy verses to interpret and to understand, but these are not difficult truths to understand. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear how important the work of Jesus Christ is to our lives each and every day. There is no greater power, no greater message that can transform the life and heart of a believer than the message of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, obeyed the law perfectly, but died the death of a sinner on our behalf, that our sins might be forgiven, and rose three days later victorious, securing the inheritance of his people and securing his victory over death, hell, and the grave. Father, this glorious truth gives us power to turn away from sin. This glorious truth gives us power to forgive those who have sinned against us. This glorious truth can empower us and grant us joy and encouragement to have hope against enemies of anxiety and depression. Father, I pray that you would use your simple gospel in our lives this morning, to strengthen us as your people. 
And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm in our service um, where we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper together. And if you are here this morning and you um, are a Christian, you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've turned away from your sins and followed him in believer's baptism, um, we invite you to partake um, this morning in the supper with us. And so um, if you're here and you're a Christian, we want you to celebrate um, the gospel that we just talked about, this, uh, the faith, the love for the saints, the hope that we have laid up in heaven. Christ has done all that for us through his body and his blood poured out on the cross. And so as we partake this morning together, just celebrate, rejoice, be grateful for what he has done for us and for what is secured in heaven on our behalf. Um, if you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Christ, we're thankful that you're here. We would just ask that you remain in your seat um, while we partake in this. And I think that you'll be blessed just by listening and watching. We hope that it will be helpful to you in your journey. So if you'll stand with us as we prepare to partake together.
night that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Hear the benediction this morning over you. May our God, who has given us faith and love and hope in Christ our Lord, grant us encouragement this week to live for him. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.